and, and things like this. Sometimes we wax nostalgic for things like in the entertainment world. Another place where we tend to look back with fondness and nostalgia is in my, in my youth, during my high school years, our Christian school teacher, every, year, every day before history class, we would come into the class and he would say, you get to do current events. Everybody in the class has to do, bring three current events uh, to talk to about the class just so we can keep abreast of what's going on in the world today. So back, you know, when I was in high school, we were figuring out what was going on with Iran-Contra and, and, and things like that that were going on back in the late 1980s, Oliver North, you know, those kind of things that were going on. And usually, we had a 15-minute break right before history class, and all of us would have forgotten that we were supposed to do this. So we were in a mass panic, and so somebody would have the Bangor Daily News, which kids came in paper form, okay? This was called a newspaper. You can still get such things today, occasionally, but what we would do with the newspaper, just to be quite honest, is a lot of times we wouldn't really scan through the news section. I would open up to the back page, and there you would find the comics. Anybody used to read the comics? Okay, I, I read the comics, and this was, you know, comics have been around for a while. Uh, you, you had some of the old stalwarts. You had Andy Cap. The Bangor Daily News still ran Andy Cap. Uh, that was one that we were like, why do you so, it's not funny, we don't get Andy Cap. You had, we had Alley Oop, uh, that was actually one of the few that wasn't supposed to be funny, it was kind of a serial uh, uh, caveman character guy, and, and you find, it, it had the Phantom, which was another serial, he was like a, a, a costume superhero guy, but probably my two favorites back in the day were the far side, Gary Larson, some of you, he still lives today for most of us in desk calendar form, you know. Um, but the other one where he really kind of hit his peak was the great theologian Bill Watterson uh, penning Calvin and Hobbes. Any Calvin and Hobbes fans here? Okay. Well, my opening illustration this morning is going to draw from a classic Calvin and Hobbes from 1995. So if we could get the, the, the picture on the screen here, I'll just read through the narration for those of you who don't know English. <laughs> Hobbes is allowed to eat at the table with me tonight, Calvin says, and we get to eat early and have grilled cheese sandwiches. This is more like it. Boy, Mom, you look nice. He says, Mom says, thank you. And it starts to click with him a little bit. Uh-oh. Hobbes is, is oblivious to everything. He has dibs on the french fries. But you understand that he's getting to eat early. His mother looks nice. It starts, he starts to do the internal math. So the next day, you had to wait a whole day for the comics to come out the next episode. We go to the next slide. And what, of course, Calvin has drawn his conclusion. And his mother says, Calvin, if you run these stockings... <laughs> And she's pretty upset. He's upset. He doesn't want anything to go on. And so Calvin is all historical. No, no, not Rosalind. That's the babysitter, by the way. Uh, help, don't leave me. And the dad's saying to the babysitter. And the neighbor's numbers are by the phone. He says, pull a leg, will you? <laughs> get, 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 get him unattached. And this is a strategy that some of you young people should take. But Ros Rosalind is very wise here, very much a capitalist. She says, I told you my rates doubled, didn't I? <laughs> There was obviously something that makes comedy, makes humor work, is Watterson had a great knack for catching on to things that we could identify with. If you aren't a fan of Calvin and Hobbes or aren't really familiar with it, the whole premise was Calvin, the, the young boy, had a little stuffed tiger. And you got to kind of alternate in the panel between what was going on in the real world, like this, or what was going on in his imagination, like when Hobbes is calling dibs on the french fries in the previous panel. So you would get to imagine what was going on in his head. You got to see his vivid mind at work. But you also saw, like many young children, when they are very much secure, very much at home and comfortable with their parents, it can be a, a situation that incites panic if 
the parents are going to be separated for any length of time. They don't have to know for what reason, unless maybe it's at grandma and grandpa's and they have ice cream or, or, or something like that. But even then, sometimes it can be unsettling for the child when separation is going to occur. What does that have to do with our text here? I don't know if Calvin uh, gave the reaction that Adam and Eve did, but I do know that as we read the text, Adam and Eve were not willing and eager to leave the surroundings. As God placed them out of the garden, as we're going to read in the text, there was a need to have a forcible removal. There was definite separation anxiety. Let's look at the text this morning, beginning in verse 22 of Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version. Moses writes, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us, that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. The outline, if you're using that on the back of your bulletin, is very short and very simple this morning. But we are reminded out of the text that God rejected, not just rejected Adam and Eve, God rejected them because God rejects sin. And sin brought with it the death penalty. It said that they knew good and evil. They had disobeyed, just like God told them what happened, by the way. The day that you eat of it, you will die. There was a consequence there that was attached to this, but it was the prediction also that God had made. I'm going to hold myself to it. Do not eat of it. The serpent had deceived them, saying that if you eat of this, you will have knowledge. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. But it was not what they expected. It is not what the serpent had promised them, but it was everything that God said it would be. The wages of sin, as we have reinforced time and again recently in this series, is death. That death, as we have already seen and are emphasizing this morning, um, uh, 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 results in separation from God. But there is also this sense of what, what is he talking about at the end of verse 22? God says, Now, lest he, lest Adam, reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. What's going on there? Is he worried that somehow... Adam and humanity will be some kind of ancient eternal rival that, okay, now they know, now we're going to be going back and forth and I won't have any power if they, they eat of this. What's going on? Is he trying to make sure that humanity remains in their place? That's actually a really good question and one the Bible doesn't speak to a whole lot. But... What I would conclude as I've studied through this and as I've tried to reason through this, it's an important thing for us to understand that this is actually something to do with God's mercy. This is something to do with seeing what God is allowing for them to get a way out, to get a way to be rectified, to get a way to escape the consequences that God has imposed upon them. And what do I mean by that? We know, and God said, that the wages of sin is death. We know that there were consequences there. But God did not want them to be trapped in an endless cycle of death 
and separation from God. We've already seen earlier in the chapter the promise that God gave, as even as he condemns the serpent. You're, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. There is going to be victory. I am going to send you a promised deliverer. Humanity is subject to death, but there is one coming, and we don't get all the details here, but we know as the story unfolds, there is one coming who by his death is going to give you life. Death is a horrible thing, but yet death is also a necessary thing in order for us to have salvation, in order for us to have deliverance. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sin. This is necessary. It is necessary, like we saw last week, for Adam and Eve's sins to be covered, for there to be an adequate covering. Animals have to die. They have to sacrifice their skins to give the capability for Adam and Eve to stand fully and completely covered before God. Something else had to die so that they would have their covering. So, what I would suggest to you is that what is happening, I believe, here in Genesis chapter 3 is God realizes if they eat of the tree of life, they will be stuck in this endless cycle of death, of separation from God. They, they will live, but they will live in their corrupted state. What happens here is now one of their descendants, Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Son of God, who is fully and completely God, yes, but also wholly and completely a human being, can take our place as God's substitute for sin. And as Jesus himself would say about himself, I have come at the end of John 10 and verse 10 that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. God sent his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem those of us who were under the curse of the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. The death penalty was real, but there was also the hope of deliverance that is shining through that. And so not allowing them to eat of the tree of life would have been out of order. That was something intentional by God. I don't want them to be stuck here. I want to allow for their deliverance. But it did, as we've already acknowledged here, also make for separation from God. It is the horror of being disinherited. It is the horror of being divorced. We tend to use that second term, that's a second point in the outline here, to describe when a, a couple that is united together in the vows of matrimony that is married ends their relationship. They are dissolving things. And many of you here have known the pain and horror of divorce, either yourselves or you've seen it in the lives of somebody that you love. I've seen it even in my own household, in my extended family. Uh, I have family who have gone through that. And it rips your heart out. You see the consequences on the spouses. You see the consequences on the children. And it is, it is something that you can offer comfort, you can offer soothing and hope, but you can never completely erase the anxiety, the consequences, the pain, the residual effects of such a horrible tear. And there is a horrific separation that has taken place here. God is sending them out of the garden. God is creating distance between them. He is saying, we had intimacy before, and now we cannot share that any longer. I am preventing you from being in the place where we had an audience, where we would walk together, where we would enjoy fellowship together, where we would have regular interaction and conversations. Those things are not available to you any longer. That is part 
of the consequences of what you have done. And to enforce that, who does he put there at the door to the garden, as it were, at, to the entrance? It says in verse 23, as God sends them out, that they are no longer welcome. Verse 24, and he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim. Now, what are the cherubim? That is a type of of spirit being. Often we call them a type of an angel. I think there are different kinds of beings that we see mentioned in Scripture. One of the most famous places we see another type of spirit being the seraphim mentioned in Isaiah chapter 6. The seraphim have six wings. It says with two they cover their eyes, with two they covered with their feet, two they flow, fl fl flew around, and then what happens? They they fly around the throne of God and they sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and was and is to come. We made reference to that in one of the songs that we sang this morning. We get this vision, uh, as it were, this picture and depiction of what it looks like in heaven. There are other kinds of angelic beings. There are messengers from God. We don't know if, for example, Michael the archangel or Gabriel, who makes the announcement in Luke chapter 2, among other places, we don't have anything else other than an indicator that they are a heavenly messenger. The Bible is actually, as much as we talk about angels in our uh, depiction and culture, we know that they're real, but we don't know a lot about them otherwise. But one of the places other than Genesis chapter 3 that does talk about cherubim is in Ezekiel chapter 10. I would invite you to open there if you would like to. The whole chapter is depicting uh, a vision that the prophet Ezekiel has had, and it describes these beings that are mentioned here just briefly in Genesis chapter 3. Reading the prophet Ezekiel in verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 10, it says, Then I looked, and behold, on the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like a sapphire, in appearance like a throne. And he said to the man clothed in linen, Go in among the whirling wheels underneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in before my eyes. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house where the man went in, when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord, that's one of the places I really want you to focus, verse 4, and the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. As you continue to scan the chapter, I'm not going to take the time to read the whole chapter this morning, but did you note what he's describing? Between the cherubim, there was a sapphire. And what did it resemble there? What does the text say? It resembles a throne. What comes up from among the cherubim? The glory of God. What do you hear? It is the voice of God Almighty. What is the court filled with? The brightness, the Shekinah glory of God. The cherub are supposed to be associated, when we have them in Scripture, with the glory, with the radiance, with the majesty, with the presence of God. And by putting the cherubim on the outside of the garden, preventing them from coming in, God was saying, the glory is not for you anymore. You no longer have access to me in that way. So what, where does that leave us today? Where did that leave Adam and Eve? It says there's a flaming sword. Some have, have envisioned that as being the cherubim actually holding uh, a weapon. Some have maybe connected that with the idea that that is somehow physical lightning, where it talks about uh, the flaming sword that's turning every way, that when they would come near, the lightning would drive them away, it would, it would intimidate them and force them away. I'm not going to fill in the blanks on that. 
There, there's different ways that people have thought through this passage. What I want you to see here is that God prevented them with the cherubim, but the cherubim are not just associated in the Old Testament with keeping people away from God. They are also associated with the way that humanity, specifically the nation of Israel, could receive the mercy of God. And we, too, are called to receive God's mercy. That's the next point and the final point on your outline. You've been in Ezekiel. Turn to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. And what do we have depicted there for us? It's a little bit of a uh, hand, simple drawing, not certainly as detailed as some have been. But what is that? Anybody in the class know? What are we trying to depict there? I'll give you a hint. It's Indiana Jones and it's the Raiders of the Lost. No, it's not the Raiders, but it's, it's the Ark of the Covenant. And what is on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? Exodus chapter 25 and verse 10. These are the instructions for its assembly. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and outside shall you overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark of the testimony that I shall give you. The testimony, in this case, is referring to the tablets of stone that Moses would receive on Mount Sinai, carved with the finger of God himself. We continue reading. Verse 15, the poles that remain in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And you, or Verse 17, rather, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, verse 18. Of hammered work you shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There it is. The stone tablets. What else is in there? The testimony the bread that God gave from heaven, the manna that he supplied, verse 22. There, what does God say? There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. The cherubim are there to guard the presence of God, yes. They're there to prevent access. But God is not depriving humanity of all communication. Sin has created a barrier. Sin is a serious barrier and presents with it serious consequences. But God is making a way for us to have access. In His mercy, He is withholding what humanity fully deserves and making a way for there to be interaction, for there to be communion between the two of them. Now, in the Old Testament here, it was not easy. Not everybody had access to the Ark of the Covenant. Where was it normally stored? In the tabernacle? In the tent of meeting? Who had access to it? 
the priests, only the priests, except for the times where they would bring it out in certain days of celebration or when they were moving it. And what would happen if the people would have contact with it? Or even the priests when they weren't supposed to. We know the story of Uzzah. What happens when he touches the ark to try to stable it? When they're not, by the way, carrying it on the poles like they should. They put it on a cart. Not the way God intended. What happens? He is struck down dead instantly. These things have obstacles. But God is still making a way for our sins to be atoned for, for there to be communication. As imperfect as this is, it is still a way. But we have a more perfect priest. We have a more perfect sacrifice. This is what John says in his epistle in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he, God, loved us. And then what did he do? He sent his son, he sent Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word. That's a word you probably don't use very much. You know what word we could put here that would make it easy for us to understand? He sent Jesus to be the mercy seat for our sins. He sent Jesus to be the place where our sins could be atoned for. What would they do with that mercy seat once a year? They would sacrifice a lamb. They would sprinkle its blood on the, on the mercy seat. And the, there, God would accept the death of that lamb as the payment for the priest's sins and the payment for the sins of the nation. They would be reminded that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness. But they had to keep repeating that over and over and over and over. Jesus Christ gave his life. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He became the Lamb whose blood was shed. He became the one who could offer up his own blood himself to the Father and make a way for us all to have access to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For us all to have access to God's truth in his word. For us to not need an intercessor or a mediator anymore. There's a reason why we don't call our religious leaders here priests. Why? Because you don't need me to talk to God for you. You don't need Pastor John to talk to God for you. You don't need the deacons. Each one of you has been made a part of God's royal priesthood. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have access because Jesus Christ has made the way. He has given you the open line. We don't have to go through rituals. We don't have to, to shield God in some kind of a special place where only a few can enter. He has opened the door wide. And the cherubim are there to welcome us in. The cherubim are there, not to hold us away any longer, but because you are clothed, as we've talked about before in this series, in the righteousness of Christ, they no longer see your sin. They no longer see what's holding you apart and holding you back. What they see, what God in his holiness sees, is the perfection, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they will let you in. God welcomes you in. Because where there was once death, where there was once disinheritance, what we remember out of this passage is this is what God put on Adam and Eve. 
This is not what God has for us today. God provides us, through Jesus Christ, with life. God provides us with a place in His family. And if you don't remember anything else of what we talked about here today, I don't care if you remember the comic strips. What I care about is that you know that yes, the Bible talks about a separation, but God wants to close that gap. God wants to give you security instead of anxiety, stability instead of panic. When you look at the reality of death, and yes, death is something we all must face, to be absent from this body is to be present with Him. Because God has bridged that gap. We have hope because we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And how can you find that peace, friend? It is by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the only sacrifice for sin, the only one who could be our propitiation, would say it this way, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever, whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Death is no longer the victor. Life reigns through the resurrection, through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Friend, if you don't have that confidence, if you don't have that certainty for yourself, do not leave today without confirming that and making sure. You don't have to remain on the outskirts. You don't have to be intimidated by the threat of consequence. Instead, you can receive forgiveness. You can have life. We thank you, Father, for the life that is ours because of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that though we all sin, though we all deserve the consequences of death for who we are and what we have done, you have made it possible for us to have life. That's all we need is Jesus. And Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. Jesus is the only one who says, come. I don't know why anybody wouldn't come and get life. And Lord, all I've tried to do here this morning is tell them how that could be theirs. We pray, Father, that you will work in their hearts, work through your word to help them see that Jesus saves and saves completely. And all they need to do this morning is believe. For it's in his name we pray.